We'll call the uh, 20th regular meeting of the Common Council to order. Sue. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, John. Oh. <laughs> Sue, would you call the roll, please? Bauman. Here. Berg. Here. Serta. Here. Graf. Here. Kittleson. Here. Laux. Here. Manny. Here. Montemayor. Here. Perez. Here. Rinfleisch. None excused. Sagali. Here. Stefan. Here. Van Akron. Here. Vanderweel. Excused. Warner. Here. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Thirteen present. Holmes present. Alderman Warner. Your Honor, I move the minutes of the last Common Council meeting of January 3rd be approved and at the same stand as entered on the record. Second. We have a motion and second before us to approve the minutes of the previous Council meeting. Under discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Alderman Vander Van Akron, would you uh, lead us in a pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, individual with liberty and justice for all. Mayor, Common Council, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, briefly explain uh, tasers, why we've asked for tasers. The history of, um, of the request began, I would say, six to eight months ago uh, when I addressed uh, several times at different meetings of the Public Protection and Safety uh, Committee concerns of conversations I had with some of our officers. Uh, some of our officers on the streets uh, were running into situations of uh, people who were resisting arrest and they were having difficulty maintaining control or getting control back. Uh, there were some situations that uh, they were concerned that uh, a deadly force uh, may have been uh, used if in fact uh, situations did not get under control at a later time. Uh, so as I brought these up to um, the public protection and safety, I said we, we are beginning to see uh, some violence on the streets and we have to take a look at what other police departments in the nation and in the state of Wisconsin are doing. Uh, they're looking uh, to tasers um, to get control of people who are disruptive or not listening and are posing a threat to my officers and or to the public. I then brought it up at a staff meeting. I attended several different presentations on tasers at different uh, meetings or conferences. After bringing it up at a staff meeting, Lieutenant Tim Eyrick, patrol supervisor uh, volunteered to research the topic, uh, to take a deeper look into it. Some of the issues, and, and Tim is the main presenter here tonight, but I just want to touch briefly on some of the issues, how we got started and where we are at this point. Uh, some of the issues that, that raised my concern was that as an administrator of a police department, the administrative staff and I were concerned of injuries to our officers, concerned of uh, situations where people were not uh, listening to what the officers were saying and, of course, how do we get these people back under control. Uh, we must understand that the mission of the police is to maintain peace and to maintain or get control uh, back under, or the situation back under control if it is out of control. So after Tim uh, volunteered to, to research the topic, Lieutenant Eric researched uh, the topic, he came back and I'll probably steal a bit of his thunder, but he, he initially told me, he says, Chief, I don't have an opinion one way or the other on these. I, I don't know anything of these. And uh, that was certainly a good choice to send because I've seen several presentations and I, I've asked him then to, to go listen, go study, and see what you come back with. <clears throat> I, I believe the controversy here, I see it, is the uh, lack of understanding of the science behind uh, electronic weapons. Um, my understanding of this comes from reading comes from um, reading of the of, of CIVMIC, of this 
October 2004, uh, their uh, recent pamphlet put out on tasers. Uh, CIVMIC uh, speaks of it is not uh, a taser it itself because its, effective, its effectiveness is not the question or it's not the problem. The concern is when, where, and how these are applied or, or used. And that's called policy and policy development as to what and when and what sort of situation they're used under. My understanding, and if, um, if you look at today's paper, the Fond du Lac Reporter, it was addressed in today's paper that the Fond du Lac Common Council and or the county, I'm not sure which entity, however, uh, they have tasers in each and every one of their squad cars in the county of Fond du Lac, effective today. So it's not only the city, it's the entire county. 35 squad cars in the county of Fond du Lac have them. We come here today because as capital outlay items were put on the table during the normal budgetary process, we came in with multiple uh, requests. One, of course, was our vehicles. Uh, we asked for a uh, number of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and we got a third of that funding. And we had $140,000 awarded to us with remaining $10,000 to be used in all sorts of different areas that we had requested a budget some of these were tasers, the backup power system for our 911 system, transcriber software, uh, police range, and it goes on and on and on. So in order to distribute that remaining $10,000, we then placed assortment of money here and over there and over here. Our taser uh, package or the program that uh, Lieutenant Eric said would be sufficient for our department, which I agree, uh, was $21,850. So, of the $10,000 remaining in the capital outlay project, we used $2,000 of that to stick into the TASER program to get this started. Uh, we also have a, a private uh, citizen who said he would donate uh, uh, two TASERs to this to get this up and running. So as we, as we look at this, this is how and why we're here today. The program that we are talking about is a package that uh, Tim will probably discuss, but it involves 20 tasers, and we would distribute them as we do with the police radios. We don't have a police radio, a portable radio for every officer, uh, nor do we, we would ask eventually down the road uh, for a taser for each officer. However, uh, as they go out on the shift, they're awarded or given a radio for the day, and we would then present them a taser to be used during the day also. So uh, 20 tasers would equip one shift out on the road, and then the next shift going out would then be given their tasers, and then you would uh, exchange these and, and charge them up as, and what else you need to do with them to keep them up and running. Uh, as I said before, the controversy of the tasers, I believe, is a lack of understanding, and my understanding of the tasers and what I've read is that it overrides the central nervous system, which means that it, the central nervous system is the system that provides the body the ability for a person to move his hands and it's the, mess the messages coming from the brains to the muscles to respond and act appropriately. Well, it disables that. It, it's, it targets the electrical charge, uh, targets the muscles and disrupts the communication between the nerves and the brain so that it, it shuts it, it disables the entire um, muscle system. And you'll see this in a demonstration uh, put on when Tim received his training. My understanding is that the brain and the heart operate on a different system completely. It's, it's called your independent nervous system. So your brain continues to operate or your lungs and your breathing and things of this nature. It does not target that. You must remember, as I spoke earlier, an administrative role uh, is uh, certainly uh, to attempt, and I would be remiss not to look for less deadly tools for my officers uh, to use. Uh, there was, uh, I, I must talk about the force continuum or the levels of force that the officers are trained in that we deal with. Now, the levels of force initially are mere presence. When an officer walks into a room, there's five different levels of force that we are allowed by, by law, of course, to use to gain, gain control or compliance. First level of force is mere, <laughs> mere presence. You walk into a room, and if someone's arguing, your mere presence or a presence of a uniformed officer sometimes will stop that. The next time or the next level of force is dialogue. We come into a room and we'll say, listen, it's enough. You go this way, you go this way. That sometimes is enough to handle that. Then it's called empty hands compliance. And this is where we're dealing with 
of the, the taser. Empty hand compliance is the use of a baton, is the use of pepper spray, and this is where the state of Wisconsin Training and Standards has placed the tasers. Now, they've ta they placed a taser in this level of force be before batons. Now, a baton is an impact weapon. A baton is meant to use as a strike. It's an impact weapon meant to hit the muscles or the bones or the knees to stop someone's resistance, okay? It's meant to cause damage. It's meant to cause bruising, to shut down that muscle system or to draw the attention. It's meant to break bones at times. Impact weapons do damage. They injure the person, they injure the officers, even our own training officers get struck by accident and they get injured. Tasers, and the best benefit of tasers is it does not cause injuries. It causes less injuries, it causes less workman's comp claims. So it's, a, it's another tool, the tasers is another tool that we're looking at to use. 4,000 police departments in, in the nation use tasers. We must understand that when I, we just recently, uh, Lieutenant Eric and I were talking about this last week, right before public protection and safety, and another one of our officers was, resist, was fighting with a resistant uh, person, and he ended up with uh, damage to his shoulder. Now, I'm telling you, it's, it's come time that we look at these other options that are out there on the market, because, as I said before, uh, the officer's job is to maintain order, and it's no longer is it acceptable, nor has it, has it ever been acceptable for my officers to sit around and wrestle on the street with someone and then end up getting injured. I think it's come time that there's an opportunity to use another option out here that has been accepted around the nation. Our police department and our officers at times deal and work in a violent world. We deal and work with people who use violence, who do not listen to what an officer says. I need not say a, a recent example of the bar fight just the other night, again, the 10th and Michigan Avenue where gunshots were, were heard from a, a disturbance. We deal in a violent world at times, people, and it's, it's meant, and that's our job, and it's meant to make your, safe, your world a little safer. Now what, it's, Jules, Jules is, is a, a term used as you talk about what these units are, and a taser is a device about one pound, it has a battery pack, and it has uh, prongs that are shot out with two cartridges of, of nitrogen to use to propel them. They, sh they shoot out and they're called joules of energy. Now an amp, an amp, a joule is, if you break an amp down, now I don't know all the most about electricity, but I, I tell you what I read, is an amp, if you break one amp of energy down into 1,000 pieces, a jewel is four of those pieces, okay? Now, a taser uses 0.36 to 1.76 joules per pulse. So you, you understand that it's, it's using a real small piece of amperage here, and that's the key to this that Tim will get into. Um, as I said before, you're looking at um, a taser uses about 50,000 volts of energy. A lightning, if in comparison, uses about 30 million of volts. Of, it's been as high as 30 million volts. Uh, high voltage is about 1,000 volts, but the amperage is real low, and that's the key to a taser. Um, so as I, as I, I, I talk, the, you know, it's very interesting if you, you see some of these presentations. The key to this, and I believe it is, it's, it's an officer safety concern and it's a public safety concern. Less injuries to my officers because I no longer find it acceptable that I, my officers have to wrestle around on the ground to control people. That happened in the day when all three of us, Lieutenant Eric, Deputy Chief Sherman and I worked the streets. You would wrestle with people to the ground because there wasn't any other methods. Now, now it's called tasers. I, I believe uh, Tim would talk of Appleton that they reduced their workman's compensation claims last year in using it you have less lawsuits because the, the uh, violence and the, uh, the energy that we apply against these people are not in batons and, and we don't use the pepper spray. Pepper spray, of course, if you, if you spray, you must immediately decontaminate the person. You must take him and, and wash them out. Effective target zones of a taser is the body, where with uh, pepper spray, it's the eyes and the nose area. 
where the, the baton, and it's the, usually the large muscle groups and a knee. So um, I went on longer than what I probably should have and what I had anticipated. Uh, I think it's tasers are one more tool that I'm asking that you take a look at. It's uh, well accepted, it's used um, by 4,000 police departments and 7,000 correctional agencies and police departments combined if you put those combinations together. So um, as I said today, the, uh, the latest out of the Fond du Lac reporter is that the Fond du Lac County, every squad car will have a taser in it. So I think it's come time that we address this. I think it's come time that um, a taser provides less injury to the uh, perpetrator, uh, to the person who's resisting arrest, less injury to our officers, less trauma uh, to the person who's been arrested, less trauma to his family, uh, because there are no law lasting injuries as uh, baton would produce. So I think it's come time. Um, enough is enough, and I think if there's a tool out there for our officers to be safer, uh, I think it's uh, certainly appropriate that the Common Council uh, take a serious look at this, provide funding. So, Tim. Good evening. Before I just present a little more in depth as to what the chief talked about, I have a uh, video from one of the sheriffs from um, Florida, if you wouldn't mind. It takes about two minutes. It talks about the tasers and their implementation in their department. I'd like to play it for you before I talk about it. Sheriff's Office in the late 2000 had six test and evaluation tasers. Since then, we bought 500 more tasers. And if things look uh, good at the end of the year budget, we're going to go to full implementation. Now, I'll also tell you that since we've uh, put the tasers on the street, we've dropped our injury deputies by 80%. And folks, for the administrators in this room and the training people, you need to go back and make sure that this tool is properly placed in your use of force matrix. Don't put it out there all the way to deadly force, or you won't get the results. You need to put it in, when that sucker wants to fight, it's time to put him down. We went from 13 use of firearms situations in the year 2000 the four in 2001, and I went 15 months without a shooting. And let me make one thing perfectly clear, the taser is fabulous. Absolutely a great tool. Out of 800 uses of the taser, folks, we've received only 16 complaints. We've seen a dramatic reduction in the use of canine by force. We apprehended more and more every year, but they're not fighting as bad. We've seen a, a drastic reduction in impact weapons, chemical agents, and physical force. Reduction in liability insurance for the administrators and training people in this room. We've also recognized a noticeable deterrence of resistance by suspects who are aware that there are deputies on the street with the taser. I love going into areas where they say, you got bad guys grabbing other bad guys, and I say, hey man, you don't want the chair. Leave the chair. He's got a chair. Don't touch that. You need to calm down. And folks, I can tell you that cost is the main deterrent. But consider this. A million dollar lawsuit or money saved on a workman's comp claim probably could buy a whole lot of tasers in your agency. I've learned from my troops that as more deputies are authorized to carry the taser, they are choosing to utilize it as opposed to the other weapons. In every category, whether it's chemical, physical, impact weapon, or firearm, the use of those types of force has reduced significantly each year since the taser has been deployed.
with that, I'd just like to introduce, I'm Tim Arvick, I'm a lieutenant on the police department. Um, I'm not an expert in tasers. Um, like the chief said, I had an opportunity to spend some time with Taser International learning how to be an instructor for Taser. Really when I went there, I didn't realize I was gonna be an instructor. I thought I was just going there to hear their spiel on how good this weapon is. And when I get there, I find out that it's an instructor course, so we learn that way. It was um, six, 18 hours of training um, that I received from the company, plus uh, a lot of homework that we had to do. So I do have a little background in it. Just a little bit about a taser. Right now, as of today, they've had about 100,000 tasings. Now that's not 100,000 people that were tased. That's 100,000 probably officers and some uh, suspects that were tased during that time. As of this date, there has been no direct deaths attributed to a taser. Right now, there's in excess of 4,000 departments that use tasers. I think that's higher, that's closer to 6,000 when you talk about across the world, uh, federal government organizations. And the big thing and the most important thing about a taser is that 99% receive instant incapacitation in less than a second. There is no other piece of equipment right now that is that effective. And the other 1% is generally due to officer error. That's usually you miss the person, or there's too bulky of a clothing, or you may have a battery malfunction on the weapon. So virtually nothing is 100%, but this weapon is, is approaching that. A Little bit on how does a taser work. Most people think a taser is nothing more than a weapon that shocks people. Well, that's wrong. It doesn't shock you. It's a EMD device. What is EMD? It's an electromuscular disruption. Taser works off of the same thing that your brain works off of. All our brains send signals to any part of our body, such as I just move my hands, my brain is telling me through electrical charges that I have to move my hand. A taser does the same thing. A taser works off of a T wave, which mimics the same waves that our brain sends out to all our muscles. So when a person is shot with a taser, what it does, it overrides the central nervous system and it disrupts sensory and motor uh, nervous system. What it does is it, it just, it uh, overloads the system which causes um, your muscles to tense up and at that point you're not allowed, you can't do anything. A Little bit on the medical history. I know that most people are really, they're not sure how bad this is. As he talked in there, they said the chair as it's known on the street. The taser is 50,000 volts. And I know that for most people they go, that's, that's shocking. But when you think about it, if I walk up to a doorknob in my house on a carpeting and it's an extremely cold day like we've had in the past couple days, I may get almost as much as 25,000 volts when I touch that knob. So it's not all that much more than you touching a knob. But what's more important in a taser is what kills a person is amperage. A taser puts out 0 .004 amps. That's the extent of it. What that converts into is joules, as the chief talked about, which is 0.36 joules. So now everyone wonders, okay, if I, if I get tased, how does that look as it compared to a cardiac defibrillator? Well, a cardiac defibrillator, like we carry, goes anywhere from 150 to 400 joules per pulse. And remember, I just told you a taser is 0.36 joules. So therefore, if we use a defibrillator on a person and a person has a pacemaker, the federal government mandates that that pacemaker has to take at least 400 joules. And obviously there's a safety built in, so I, and I'm not sure exactly what the safety is, but it's well above that. So what you're looking at is no way can a taser affect a person on it that has a, a defi or has a, um, a, pul a pacemaker, I'm sorry. Also age is not affected by um, a uh, taser, nor is water. If a person's standing in water and an officer shoots a person with it, they're not gonna be electrocuted. You ask, where do we use this weapon? As the chief explained before, all officers work on a force continuum which is mandated by the state of Wisconsin. The continuum basically starts off with um, talking and it goes up all the way up to using your weapon which is deadly force. 
A taser is placed in right after the empty hands compliance, which means if I ask someone to place their hands behind their back and they don't, the state does state that I can use a taser at that point. Generally, officers aren't going to use it that low. They're usually going to wait until someone becomes a little resistive to it. But it actually is below the use of pepper mace, and it's also below the baton. So therefore, the state sees this as a very safe type of weapon when used against the public. So you ask yourself, why does the police department want to go to a taser? Well, there's many reasons. Some of them are, this weapon is very effective and efficient. As I stated before, 99% instant incapacitation in less than a second. Officers don't have to have to roll around on the ground with them. There's no long-term effects. In fact, the injuries that many uh, people have are minor skin irritations, muscle soreness, dizziness, which is very short-term, and sometimes minor bleeding from when the um, taser is shot into the person from the prongs. There is no known nervous system damage, nor is there any heart or brain damage. It works well in all environments and weather conditions, which is important to us. It reduces the need for medical treatment of individuals who otherwise would have been subdued by a police baton or pepper spray. And like the chief explained to you, when you hit a person with a baton, you're going to break bones. You're going to hurt them seriously. If you use OC, you end up um, having to clean up that person. Some of the times they have to go to the hospital. The other part with OC is, is that no matter what, you OC the person, you still have to go hands-on, and most officers get some of that on them, and they end up having the effects of OC. It reduces, it reduces, uh, oh, I'm sorry. It works on all types of individuals, and there are no known cases where individuals are able to develop pain tolerance through this. They cannot fight through this. You can't develop a pain tolerance. Where OC you can, and baton you can too. A lot of times you're gonna find when people are very high on drugs, you can hit them as many times as you want with that baton. You can hit them in the knee, you can hit them in the elbow, where our strike zones are, and it has no effect on them at all. A taser, you're gonna tase the person and they're gonna go down. It works especially well on high, or people who are high on drugs or emotionally disturbed people, where otherwise methods to subdue them are ineffective. And I hate to keep going, you know, you don't want to talk about war stories, but about eight years ago, a partner and I, we ended up arresting an individual down along the lakefront that was high on drugs. And I'm telling you, it was the worst war I ever went through. It was about nine minutes of total fighting. Equipment was laying all over the road. We never did subdue this guy until we got six people on him. It just, whatever you did to this person, you couldn't stop him. The weapon is medically safe, even on individuals who have pacemakers, as I explained before. Police departments have seen a huge reduction in officers' injuries related to subduing and controlling subjects. So how does that affect you? Well, that's workers' comps. As in Appleton, they reduced their workers' comp in their first year by thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. That's important because that money is directly, that doesn't have to be budgeted it also means that that officer can be on the road. He is not off the road. Um, it reduces a reduction in lawsuits reference excessive force. The weapon also has a computer built into it. Only the trained individual, who, uh, such as myself, the trainer, can download that information. What it tells you is the date, the time, the weather conditions, the duration, the number of times you pull the trigger on this weapon. So therefore, if an individual comes back and says to the police department, the officer placed this weapon on me and he shot me for 20 minutes constantly, we can go back to this weapon and we can check and find out what it actually was. Was it a one five second burst or was there two five second bursts? But the officer cannot cheat on that. It's encrypted so we can't change it. So that's really important for us. It also gives the option to officers to carry a taser and they can either carry a baton or OC. The other important thing is it does work on animals. And you've seen in the past where we've had some animals where we've shot in dogs because we had to. A taser will, will put a dog down and generally after they get up, they're gone. They're, they're gone. 
They're, they won't be taken the second time because they break the leads and, and they are gone. So therefore you don't have to use deadly force when, uh, having in, when coming in contact with animals. The other important thing that I would say in closing is, is that the training is only four hours. We can do it in-house, which saves us a lot of money. Um, and now that we have an individual that is an instructor, we can do it there. It's not a miracle weapon, and I don't want to sell it as that. But it is a nice tool that we can use, that it does help the officers to protect them, gives them a little more security, plus it also gives the citizens a lot more security. Um, I'd also like to show one more video, and I think most of you probably want to see what a taser actually does to a person. And I have one here where an officer actually was tased, and I'll show it to you. And if you'd like, um, if you have questions, I'd be willing to answer them to you as best I can. Okay. I'll show you that. Okay. Five seconds, one trigger pull, it's automatic, five seconds. He got shot in the back. He went down, that's what you're normally gonna see because you saw his muscles seized up. He, when he was on the ground, after it was over, you notice how he just got up, smiling, and um, as if he had no ill effects whatsoever. But in that time, when they're on the ground, the officer can actually handcuff the individual if they need to be or at that point they become compliant. So it's not a very long process. Council, do you have any questions? Alderman Martin. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a, f a few questions. Were you tased? Yes, I was. Okay. The five seconds? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, I think you tried to explain what makes the victim lose control, and I think I sort of have the idea now. Okay. How do you remove the darts, and do you have to worry about AIDS and sterilizing that and all that? No. Um, on the new um, tasers, there it's a um, they, um, it's a different type of force that's used. So when you do remove it, um, it's actually sealed. So most officers wear leather gloves and all you do is you put your hand on their back pull the prong pull it out and there's absolutely no bleeding generally there's no bleeding the older weapons there was some minor bleeding and I had it on the older weapon the M series not the X series um, and I had a little bit of bleeding but I bet you in about three minutes it was gone a band-aid and that took care of it but the prongs are going to be used again right no oh they're the not prongs Actually, you take the prongs, the, the weapon is a one-time discharge, okay. and uh, the prongs are about an inch and a half, and actually look like a little actual fish hook on the end. And once you pull them out of the individual, you pull the cap off of the gun, and you put the prongs right back into the, um, where they came out of, and you throw that whole thing away. Gun and all? Huh? Not the no. gun, just, just there's a little, that. there's a little um, I guess you can call it an ammo cartridge that's put on the end. And so they're put in there and they're thrown away and that's the end of it. Um, now my question wasn't so much about 
starting a heart or, or interfering with a pacemaker. My question is about stopping a heart. There's somebody like my husband who has that arrhythmia, and it just takes a little bit to push him over the edge of death. And of course, most um, teenagers that you hear about that die on basketball floor, floors and things like that, it is sudden death because they have a fibrillation of their heart. And sometimes it takes just a tiny bit to put them over the edge. So that's more what I'm concerned about. This isn't a shock weapon. There is no shock. It's, a, it's sending waves into your body, but it's not shocking your heart. It's not shocking your brain. So therefore, you wouldn't have that. They've never had, in, in over the 100,000 uses that we've had, there has never been one instantaneous death. All the deaths that they've had have been attributed to all different kinds of weird things, but never to, you know, and then they directly try to put it back on a taser, but it's never been directly. Never fibrillation. Never, never. Um, when I went to training school, the ages mm -hmm. at that training school ranged from, I'm guessing probably in the low 20s to there were some that were in their mid 50s, and every one of them took one and had absolutely no problems. Well, yeah, but those, those were people in good condition and that right. knew they didn't have any right. fibrillation problems. Right. They've, they've done studies with defibrillators on these with animals in that, and it has not affected them at all. No, it's not. Once a person has a defibrillator, right, then it wouldn't. Or but I mean, it's before pacemaker. you get a defibrillator. Right. It still doesn't have any effect on the heart. Doesn't have any effect on the heart. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Alderman Press. Thank you, Mayor. Is there, has there ever been an instance where the individual that got tased needed medical treatment afterwards? Yes, there for, has. For been. the use of the taser, I mean, I'm not talking about anything else. Yes, there has. And what kind? That of has generally been um, injured elbow, injured shoulder. I believe there's about 20 incidences of that in when the United States. That's when they fall. Okay, and what does the Sheboygan Police Department have in mind to provide medical help should the taser be used? Now, I'm referring it, back to what Chief said, a policy of when, why, or where. Does the police force uh, department have a policy in place now for to, tasers? to address the use of the taser gun? No, because we don't have tasers. I know. Okay. Will you put one in place? Yes, we would. You will put it one It would in be place. prior to them going on the road, we'd have a policy on it. Yes. Okay. And you talked about reduction in workman's comp uh, cases. Will we be able, Ed, perhaps, maybe you can answer this, will we be able to track that to see where are our workman's comp claims now and where will they be in a year or two? I would think that would be we'll fairly be easy to, to check. Okay. Now, as far as the use of force, and I'm not talking about deadly force, just the use of force, do we keep a record of that now? As to <coughs> how many instances we've had, the police department has had to use just force to, to the point where perhaps the <coughs> taser could have, should have been used. Yeah, we do. Is it all? And just in general terms, is it pretty high or pretty low? Or? We have. Uh, first off, about your policy question, we're going through accreditation efforts right okay. now. And that's basically what that is, is a commitment to policy development to make sure that our policies are the latest policies as we compare them to other departments around the state and nation. So these will not be used in, without policy de uh, development, and certainly we will sit down with other departments who have policy on it. So we also have, now with this issue, we also have a use of force form that okay is filled out and kept in the deputy chief's office. So as far as the number of, of, of those, I, I, Al, you have to speak on that, but we do keep track of baton okay. strikes, and pepper spray, and things of this nature. But just also asking about, like, if we are wrestling with people, if yes. we keep track of that? Well, it's use of force, I guess, that you're getting to a point, and, and I'm just talking in general terms, is it a real high number, real low number? There's been a, you, you see a, you've, we've, we've seen an increase, so I've seen an increase over my career in the use of pepper spray, baton strikes, um, the use of, uh, of drawing a weapon on an individual compared to when I first came in. Yes, there's been a, a substantial increase. And yes, we do keep track of all those as to the 
just the basic wrestling matches. I'm not sure we, an officer, we don't keep track of those unless it's where some serious force is used where we use um, knee strikes or elbow blitzes or stuff like that. Then okay. we would definitely keep track of that. Okay. Yeah, the, only, the only thing that I'd add to that, go, that is always put in the report. If there's uh, knee strikes or if they're having used force to put the handcuffs on, the, uh, the, the reports that are kept in my office is if a firearm is drawn, if a baton is used, if OC is used. As far as in, in those cases, there's, uh, there would be, I would say, a couple that would come in each weekend. This weekend there was one. Okay. And, uh, but it, it's normal for a couple of those to be on my desk each week, weekend and uh, a couple during the, during the course of the week. But all the, all the force related in a, in a complaint is in that particular complaint. But as far as keeping a chart of when somebody's got to force, if an officer's got to force somebody's arms behind their back, that we don't have specific. Okay. Okay. And one more final question. The, uh, the age group that this thing, did you expect to use this thing with? I mean, are you going to pop somebody at 90 years old or one year old or two years old? What, do, you, do you have something in mind? You, because of the safety of the equipment, you can actually, they, they teach us you can go 2 to 76 or higher. But again, you go back to policy, you're not going to use it on a two-year-old. Okay. You're not going to use it on a, a ten, generally not a 10-year-old. Um, and higher up, we've had people in their 60s and 70s that have been pretty, pretty well. Huh? Oh yeah, wrestling very well. Um, but again, that comes to the professionalism of an officer and, and the situations. It's just like we carry OC and we carry batons and we don't use those every time we have a resistive person either. So this is just gonna be another one of those that fits into our use of force. So its use will be discretionary pursuant to a policy you'll be put in place. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. I uh, thank you, Honor. Uh, I guess, Lieutenant Eric, one thing, and I remember this, but for the council's sake, the amount of force that we use, or actually the injuries that occur from the use of force in the present way we deal with it, when you use tasers, the injuries that occur to the officers and to the individuals are down, which lowers the medical costs and the time in the hospital for the, the people who are tased, the criminal, and the officers. And all those issues drop way down. Rather than having a broken bone, a person might bang their head a little bit or bang an elbow, but they're not cracking an arm or things like that, correct? Exactly, yes. You're going you're gonna to find that every time we've used... Um, a baton, almost every time I should say, they're going to the hospital. They're going to want to go to the hospital. Um, it's quite a few of the people that are in pepper spray want to go to the hospital. Um, and then it becomes who, who pays, you know. I, I don't know the exact thing. With a taser, you're not going to see as you're going to see that very infrequently. Yes, you may see someone fall to the ground in a weird manner because he was tased and may hurt his elbow. That that may happen. But it's going to happen if we have to use other types of force anyways, which are much more detrimental to a person than a taser. If I could just uh, respond uh, to Alderman Montemayor's uh, concern. Uh, the studies I've read, or the, the one study I read, was they had a, a person who was attached to EKG and they monitored the heart rate uh, when he was tased and there was no effect the heart the, the person fell um, and there was no effect to the heart uh, heartbeat or heart rate whatever the EKG monitors so thank you your honor my question goes to the durability of the weapon itself okay. uh, is there a certain limit of, of the charges you can put into them do they wear out after a Yes, they do. Um, the battery life is, is 10 years or 159 shots where you shoot them. Um, then the battery gets thrown away and you buy another battery and um, the batteries are $100 a piece. Um, so the, the batteries are not cheap, but 159 tasings is a, is a whole lot of, of tasings. Um, they have a one-year total guarantee 
the city can um, actually buy some extra insurance for a three-year full guarantee that at any point if something goes wrong with that weapon you send it in they send you back a new one so um, they stand behind the weapons they're very simple there's not a lot to them um, the officers don't fool around with them um, it's basically you just put the the front um, clip on where the prongs come out of and you turn the weapon on when you need to that's the sum total of of taking care of it uh, the person that's the trainer he has to do the downloading of of when they're done and that may be every once a month or so you can download that into a computer um, maybe just cleaning the weapons to make sure they're clean but that's about the amount of it uh, my understanding is they've had tasers out there six to seven years and have had no problems whatsoever with them. They're not affected by cold. Um, they're not affected by wet weather. They're not affected by heat. Um, so they're a very durable weapon. They're made out of plastic. Michael, do you have a question? Uh, thank you, oh, Lieutenant. I, one quick question. The $2,000 that's on our agenda tonight, how many tasers is that going to actually get us? Uh, a taser cost, oh, I can, basically. A taser cost $800, and that includes um, the battery, that includes a holster, and the gun itself. Um, you also have to be able to buy a, a data port, which is the downloading. That's $150. The cartridges um, that we use on the street are $22 a piece. And then there's training cartridges, which are $16 a piece. And uh, I asked for three extra batteries because you always know something's going to happen with the battery. and You really don't want a, a, a weapon down if you can keep it up. That's where we come up with the $21,850. That would be total package. That's a total package. That's 20 tasers, 100 of the... Um, cartridges we'd use on the street, 200 of the training cartridges. And that would pretty much take us through the year. I would guess that if we needed to, our, our um, equipment budget would be able to buy the necessary extra cartridges. Thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. Appreciate it. Okay, Mayor's appointments. Stated today, I uh, hereby submit the following appointment for your consideration to William Longerman to be considered for appointment to the Historic Preservation Commission to fill the unexpired term of Richard Lundeen, whose term expired 43006, signed by the Mayor. That lies over. Public forum, Sue? Uh, Mr. Frank Pulpson. Of course. <laughs> is this on? I guess it is. Uh, 2829 Erie Avenue. Okay, thank you. I want to express my thanks for the opportunity to speak before the council. Last time, time was called on me, so I'd like to conclude my remarks. And before presenting all my points, I would like to summarize what I said two weeks ago. The point of that presentation was to call into question the committee's report Kimmy reports conclusion about Sheridan Park being the best choice for the police station. The Kimmy report has been held up as the basis of an objective, rational, impartial decision-making process that just happened to conclude Sheridan Park was a better location than three other sites included in the report. In fact, the Kimmy report is a stacked deck from which Sheridan Park was dealt a losing hand. If you recall, I disclosed that there was a dirty little secret about the Kimmy report that an engineer in the home office of Kimmy revealed during our phone conversation a few weeks ago. That dirty little secret of the Kimmy report compromises its objectivity and discredits the claim that it is a worthy document to be the basis of a decision-making process that settled upon the Sheridan Park as the first choice for the police station. You see, in order to rank the various sites being considered, variables are used to produce numerical ratings for each site. Sheridan Re Park received a top rating of 365 the Imperial Motel site was next to 346, a difference of 19. Bear that in mind. The dirty little secret of the report is that these weighted variables do not represent a universal standard of evaluation. It's not like uh, the National Building uh, Electrical Code. 
These vary from project to project as a reflection of what the sponsors of the project consider important. Variables can be tweaked to favor a particular outcome. Tweak them one way, and Sheridan Park is the best choice. Tweak them differently, and the Imperial site looks, uh, Motel site looks the best. Remember, only 19 points difference. As two weeks ago, who produced the variables known as the site selection criteria in the report? Who spoke for the citizens and their values and priorities? Page 28 of the Kimry report says, the staff team reviewed the criteria and confirmed that these issues were representative of what was important to selecting a site. Where's the citizen input? The Kimmy report, also page 28, goes on to state that following this selection of criteria, staff team discussion of each issue on each site established a consensus value, whose consensus, of how that site rated on each issue. So it turns out that the same team that decided those tweakable criteria also took control of assessing each site according to those criteria. The site selection uh, team had access to every tool that would guarantee the exact outcome they favor and assured that any outcome the citizens would prefer would never get a fair hearing. The group was judge, jury, and executioner, and they made sure that Sheridan Park received the death sentence. Citizens can properly ask who was on that staff team and why they could presume to decide what was important to the citizens of Sheboygan. I started two weeks ago, and I'm starting again tonight, that the staff team was, in fact, the Building Use Committee. Three aldermen, Alderman Berg, Alderman um, Warner, and Alderman uh, Wangeman, whose bias is against preserving Sheridan Park. If I'm wrong in my insertions, assertions, then let the aldermen take the floor, present their rebuttals, telling me that I'm wrong, exactly why I'm wrong. Please tell us that the Kimmy Report is not a fig leaf serving to conceal the aldermen's manipulation of the site evaluation process to produce the outcome they favored and prevent the outcome most citizens would prefer. And how would the citizens be given the voice to express their preference? You know, even though the council ignored the petition re requesting a referendum, the citizens have recourse to an alternative that would give voice to their feelings. Let me describe this quasi-referendum, especially to the voters in the 5th District where Gene Davis is running unopposed. First of all, even though there is no contest, please do not sit home on Election Day. Go to the polls. Yes, Gene Davis is not a known quantity. He hasn't voted for or against Sheridan Park. He does have experience. He told me. I talked to him. I told him I was going to get up here and talk about this and don't take this personally. I'm not against him. But when those voters go, they can go and where it says write in candidate, they can write in Sheridan Park. I'm sure there are people in his district there, in 5th District, who even though Sheridan Park is not their park, they have strong feelings about the park. They have strong feelings about how the, uh, the council has treated the citizens' uh, input and, uh, and has really rough, run roughshod over efforts such as the petition. These people have a chance by uh, simply writing in Sheridan Park, and as a matter of fact, every citizen in Sheboygan has a chance of writing in Sheridan Park on the right in line to express themselves. We would have a referendum. It would be clear. It would be uh, uh, quantifiable, and it would be reported. So for the rest of the districts where there will be a contest between two candidates, the upcoming primary runoff and elect April election will give the citizens a chance to express their will. A very real possibility is for them to change the makeup of the council and thereby make their will known. Thank you. Thank you for having me here tonight. And can I have your home address, please? 1323 Superior Avenue. 1323 Superior. And you will have five minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Emmy Tadek, and I'm here to talk to you about an organization that I have recently founded to provide help to the tsunami victims. It came to my attention that the Red Cross was not openly promoting the issue. And so I decided to become the person in between the people and the Red Cross to try and get funding for the tsunami victims. I have founded Operation Hope. And I have done this because my best friend, Rajiv Kassat, is in India right now. And he had sent me an email the day after the tsunami on December 27th stating that they need help. It is a horrendous sight over there, and the pain is just <coughs> indescribable. So I am asking for donations from whoever can help to 
be made to Operation Hope, which is through the Red Cross International Relief Fund, and be mailed to Operation Hope at 2720 Muth Court in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, with tsunami relief written in the memo of the check and the check written out to Red Cross International Relief Fund. Thank you. Thank you. And Carter Paulus, please. Mr. Paulus, could I get your home address, please? 414 Erie. Thank you, sir. And you will have five minutes. As a member of the Sheboygan County Taxpayers Alliance, I would like to know when your fiscal irresponsibility would end. You don't have the money, but you want to spend $300,000 to tear down the incinerator plant when you had, not too many years ago, an opportunity to have it used profitably and for the good of the community. You don't have the money, but first you wanted to spend $2,000 for a taser gun, and before one can catch their breath, you now want to spend over $21,000 for taser guns. This action should not be decided until you get a professional, unbiased medical opinion first, either in person or in writing. Let's satisfy the community completely. It appears that the police department and the people present are not aware of what will kill a human being in the form of electricity. So I will tell you. The human being has a resistance of 33,000 ohms. One tenth of an ampere will kill you. 6,000 volts will kill you because the pressure is too great. So there, I hope that helps a little bit in clearing up what about electricity will do to a human being. To continue, you don't have the money for adequate numbers of policemen in our community. And before anyone perceives that I may be against a police force, my father-in-law is a retired police lieutenant, or was a retired police lieutenant, from the Sheboygan Police Force. Your increasing debt exceeds your budget and your spending but you don't have one red cent or one plan to pay off on your principal debt of $66 million. You owe more than what you have. Has anyone informed you that you are running on empty? Boy, do you have your fiscal irresponsibilities mixed up. I wonder how many homeowner citizen taxpayers are aware that two-thirds of your water bills is in fees just collected by the water department for the city in lieu of taxes. In other words, if the average homeowner's annual water bill is three to six hundred dollars, two hundred to four hundred dollars is taxes on top of your property taxes, plain and simple. This totally unfair taxation process needs to be brought to a screeching halt. But you have time to reduce the last council meeting to tirades against anyone who disagrees with the present regime's fiscal irresponsibility, which leads one to ask those who are more interested in attacking the democratic process what you will be doing when you grow up. I'm really sick and tired of this unresponsive city government excessively taxing and feeing my family, my children's estate, and me. 
It is time to bring this stupid fiscal irresponsibility to an end in the next election. Okay. Before we get into the consent, consent agenda, I would like to read something to you this evening. Good evening, Citizen Sheboygan. As mayor, I recognize that only as a team united in purpose can we address today's issues and tomorrow's challenges in our community. For that reason, I am proud to announce the formation of the Ergo Commission. Ergo stands for Efficient Regional Government Opportunities. The goal of Virgo Initiative is the stabilization of local tax rates while promoting a higher standard of living and economic development. The Commission, through the further development of international, intergovernmental relations, will assist in the coordination of plans, policies, and programs to address and resolve issues of mutual interest. Examples of matters of Virgo Commission will undertake will undertake our shared services and intergovernmental contracts. The Ergo Commission initiative re represents the community's core values and visions. The Commission is founded on local leadership from business, labor, and government for the express purpose of promoting intergovernmental cooperation. I will have a list of members of the Ergo Commission ready for com Common Council's approval in the near future. The Commission will have monthly reports to the City of Sheboygan and to the community for their goals, progress, and acquired objectives. Thank you. With that, Alderman Warner, consent agenda. Your Honor, I move that all ROs be accepted and placed on file, all RCs be accepted and adopted, and all resolutions, substitute resolutions, and ordinances be passed. Second. We have a motion and a second before us that all RCs be accepted and adopted. All RCs be accepted and adopted. Resolutions be accepted and filed. Ordinance, general ordinance be put up under passage. And that's 21 through 2017. Are there any questions? If not, would you call the roll? Bauman. Aye. Berg. Aye. Serta. Aye. Graf. Aye. Kittleson. Laux, Aye. Manny, Aye. Montemayor, Aye. Perez, Aye. Sigali. Aye. <laughs> I heard. Aye. Stephan, Aye. Van Akron, Aye. Ann Warner. Aye. 13 ayes. Motion carried. 2018 through 2021 to be referred. 2022 through 2030 to be referred. If you look at 2025, it has public works. That will also go to public protection and safety, a document 2025. 2031 by Alderman Groff, Stefan, Serta, Manny, and Montemayor, authorizing transfer of appropriation in a 2005 budget. Alderman Groff. Yeah, I would move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. We have a motion and a second before us, under discussion. Hearing none, would you call the roll, please? Berg. Aye. Serta. Aye. Graf. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. Laux. Aye. Manny. Aye. Montemayor. 2031. 2031. We're voting on. 2031. Yes. No. Okay. No. 2031 is not. 2032 is the teaser. No, 2031. No, 2031 is also the transfer. initial $2,000. Yeah. 2031 Excuse is a transfer. Me. Right, that's the transfer. Go ahead. Okay, Perez. Sigali. This Aye. is the. <laughs> Stefan. Aye. Van Akron. Aye. And Warner. Aye. 12 eyes, one no. Motion carried. Oh, I'm sorry. And Bauman. Aye. <laughs> 12 eyes, one no. Thank uh, you. 2032 by Alderman Warner, Vanderwill, <laughs> Sigali, Reinflesh, and Surter regarding the acquisition and the use of tathers by the Sheboygan Police Department. Alderman Warner. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I move the resolution be put upon its passage. Right. We have a motion and a second before us under discussion. 
Under discussion, Your Honor, uh, for, for the pub, uh, viewing public, I'd like to read the resolution. It's relatively short, and I think it makes some points that, that need to be known. And I, uh, there may be some alterations coming along also. Uh, this is a resolution regarding the acquisition and use of tasers by the Sheboygan Police Department. Whereas, the personal safety of our citizens and police officers is a primary responsibility of the Common Council. And whereas, access to tasers by the Sheboygan Police Department will increase the safety of our citizens and police officers. And whereas, the availability of tasers as a non-lethal means of ensuring compliance with the law will enhance citizen and police officer safety. Be it resolved that the Common Council of the City of Sheboygan recognizes the importance of citizen and officer safety and the role that tasers will play in ensuring that safety. Be it further resolved that the Common Council of the City of Sheboygan supports the purchase of tasers by the Sheboygan Police Department to better protect its citizens, guests, and police officers, as well as all emergency service workers such as firefighters and other emergency personnel. Your Honor and fellow council members, uh, this resolution was discussed at length at Public Protection and Safety Committee's last meeting on Wednesday. And it is the belief of the committee that the purchase of, and use of tasers by the police department is in the best interest of the city of Sheboygan. Our meeting was full of information, uh, questions, answers, and we believe strongly in the intent and focus that this resolution brings forward as a measure of support from the Common Council for acquisition of the tasers. We're not purchasing them with this. It's just saying we understand what tasers are, how they're used, and that we believe it would be in the best interest of the city of Sheboygan and the police department to have tasers to use. Uh, the safety of our city, its citizens and guests, the safety of our police officers and those individuals they may come in contact with while serving are primary concerns. We discovered that tasers are also important to other emergency personnel, such as firefighters and emergency medical technicians, when faced with unruly or potentially dangerous individuals. Mm. I've read numerous studies over the last couple of weeks. I've got several of them here. Anyone's welcome to see them and read them if they like. Uh, there are instances where at, at a scene uh, for an ambulance crew or first responders where a person is very hard to control and they need medical attention where tasers have been used to get that person subdued to a point that they can be put under control by handcuffs or, or ties or something so that they can actually receive medical attention. There's in, uh, examples of that across the board, across the country. They actually use them in prisons and other places too to uh, get control of prisoners in, in certain instances uh, without doing any harm to them. The presence of a police officer with a taser will help to ensure all emergency response personnel are better protected should the need arise to maintain order and control when placed at risk. We believe, as I said, that this new tool for our police will benefit everyone, and therefore we believe this resolution is an essential statement of support. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Montclair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I'm just not convinced all of this will happen. I think it's a wonderful idea. I'm just not convinced all of it will happen. I've been studying a lot, and I have all this information about tasers from the internet. And today, there's a class action complaint filed against taser. Georgia law firm Chitwood and Harley LLP said Friday it filed a class action complaint charging Arizona-based Taser International Inc. with securities fraud. Scottsdale, Arizona-based taser manufacturers stun guns for use in law enforcement, private security, and personal defense. The cl claimant was filed on behalf of investors who purchased taser securities between April 6, 2004 through January 10, 2005. The complaint charges that taser defendants issued materially false and misleading statements to the market concerning the safety of its taser guns between April 6, 2004 and January 10, 2005. The complaint also charges that in the fourth quarter, Taser inflated its accounts receivables, an illegal practice called channel stuffing, used to inflate stock value by sending retailers more merchandise than they could sell. Also, regulator wants more information regarding stun gun safety. Phoenix, federal authorities have launched an inquiry into claims Taser International Inc. has made about safety studies for its stun guns, and so forth and so on. From the New York Times, July 2004, 
a lot of things, but the largest police departments have been slow to embrace the taser. The New York poli Police Department owns only a handful of tasers, which are used by specialized units and supervisors, the spokesman said. So while I think it's a wonderful idea, I'm not convinced it works all that beautifully. So I'll be voting against it. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Stefan. Uh, yes, you know, um, I've always supported having an open forum before the meetings, but one of the downsides of that is people can get up and say anything they want, and if you're watching on TV, you just have to assume it's true. Uh, I just wanted to point out one of the misrepresentations earlier this evening. The last document, we approved one taser at $2,000, and basically by this one, you know, we're telling the chief, you can go out, you know, and try to solicit more money, and maybe sure. in the future we'll have more money, but all we're spending is $2,000, and I, I think that's clear. The public's got to know we're not just coming up with $21,000 we don't have. Yes, that's the goal, to get that much, to get it donated, to whatever the case may be, but I think it's just an example of, uh, you know, somebody gets up and talks and we just assume it's true, and in this case, it's, it's I'll just say it's a mistake. I don't think anybody was intentionally lying or deceiving us. And I do have some concerns, like Alderman Montemayor, but I think this council knows firsthand that, you know, anybody can file a lawsuit. Out of 100,000 tasings, if there's three, four, five lawsuits, I mean, I'm shocked that there's not 50 or 100 of them, to tell you the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Perez. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to make a few comments here. I, I do, I, I believe, as most of you have, went on the Internet and looked up as much information as possible. Uh, there's good and bad. Uh, there's pro and, uh, and against uh, the taser guns, the use of it, and so forth. Uh, I've always had mixed feelings about it. Uh, uh, I'm concerned for the safety of the police officers, but I'm also concerned for the safety of the general public where in an instance, uh, God forbid, it would happen that somebody gets tased and they shouldn't have it been tased. Uh, I think it's important for this council to, to know or understand, and the community, I should say, to understand that uh, whether we approve the use of taser guns by resolution or not, this council is free to revisit the issue should things get out of control or things not be well with the use of taser guns. Uh, this is not something that we're locking ourselves into. We've pretty much given our, or we'll give our blessing to the use of taser guns and that's it. We can always come back and revisit that. Uh, I think the main concern here, uh, given our, our, our fiscal problem, is for Chief Kirk to understand that if we're going to go out and budget twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for taser guns, that somehow that'd be balance with uh, the use of personnel and other um, other things that they need in the department. There's only so much money to go around and if, uh, we need to be careful that we prioritize. If taser guns are more important than police officers, then by all means that decision will be made by Chief Kirk and uh, I think that decision should be respected. But we need to be careful that, that if we go out buying additional things that weren't budgeted for, it's only going to take the money from somewhere where it's already at put it somewhere where, the, where it's going to go and there's a vacuum here. So they, we need to be careful with that. Uh, again, I have mixed feelings about this, uh, but I think the uh, turning point for me was the, the research that I did and obviously witnessing uh, a video of somebody getting zapped and getting up. And I think uh, our officer said he got zapped and did he's living. Well. Pardon me? He's living. And he's living and he did a presentation. I don't want to get it zapped. I thought maybe Chief Kirk would try it tonight, but he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, uh, with mixed feelings and so forth, but out of respect for uh, safety of police officers and uh, with the understanding that we can always revisit this and that those uh, adjustments will have to be considered in the police department, uh, I will support it. Thank you. Alderman Groff. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, just to add to what um, Alderman Perez and Alderman Stephan said, um, yeah, this will be um, that we're supporting the purchase of, of tasers, but we aren't authorizing any funds or anything like that. Uh, when funds become available, be they donations to, to purchase tasers for the police department and so forth, then um, businesses may, may contribute um, because I believe the chief mentioned something that um, someone had already offered to, to do a couple or something like that. So that still comes back to council. So council can still revisit it, as Alderman Perez said at that particular time. I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on this, that um, this doesn't mean or does not give the police department carte blanche to, to spend any funds on, 
until funds become available and then everything goes through council again. Thank you. <coughs> Alderman Warner? You I think uh, just a few more things I wanted to touch base on. Uh, there's a lot of information on the internet and you also have to be careful where you get it from. Uh, and you have to sift through it and, and really pay attention to make sure you're getting the right information. But there have been numerous studies on tasers across the country. You know, we're not, there's over 6,000 agencies across the country that are using tasers now. Prisons, police departments, medical departments, uh, all kinds of places. And so there have been a lot, a lot of studies done out there. One of them is the HECO uh, study that was done in 2004. That was by the Department of Defense. And in that study, some of the things they found out, uh, that was through the Air Force Research Laboratory and the Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Program. And the HECO study concluded that taser technology is generally effective without significant risk of unintended results. In order for this taser to work, both darts have to hit the individual. So if, you, if an officer should miss the target, the other target would have to get both darts in order to have any impact. Uh, but the study also states that there are no cases of ventricular fibrillation ha that have been reported in the thousands of training or field exposures incidents with a taser. And that would answer one of the questions Marilyn had earlier. Um, it also indicates as, as well that the increased use of tasers has decreased the overall injury rate of both police officers and suspects in conflict situations. Bottom line in, in this whole thing is that tasers offer a higher level of protection to everyone involved while providing a legitimate and important option to using a higher level of force such as pepper spray nightstick or the highest level a gun. Uh, once you get to that level, obviously the damage is much greater. I just think that we're taking a step forward and saying this that, that we uh, support the safety of our police officers but also the people that are, are, are maybe psychotic and most of these people are, have mental illness who, who have problems with these things and are on drugs at that time when that's when they're resisting the most and when you have this aspect in there, this will actually protect them better. It's a lot better than getting shot with a gun as I've said in the past. So I think we're going in the right direction. Thanks. Thank you. Alderman Scully. Thank you, Your Honor. I think what's starting to bother me about this whole thing now is that we're questioning our own police officers. They're the ones that are putting their lives on the line for us. They're the ones that have to go out and deal with these criminals. Did we question them when they were given guns and bullets? Did we question them when they were given their pepper spray? Did we question them when, we got, when they got their batons? Why are we now questioning how they are going to use the tasers? They are professional people. We trust them with our lives, and we should not be questioning them. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Serta. Thank you, Your Honor. It's been said here tonight that, you know, just reiterating that we're only going to be purchasing a, purchasing a few and that in the future we'll address that issue again. I believe that if we're making this a priority now, um, we cannot see the true cost savings and make a fair estimate if we're only equipping our officers with just two taser guns. I think if we're, we make this initiative, we have to seek and make it a priority in finding the finances available. Yes, they're going to pursue other avenues, um, securing maybe some um, donations through the private sector, but I think it, it's important that we do make this a priority. And I would like that we would see those numbers reflected after we've imp implemented these tasers, but just to base that on just two taser guns I don't think is going to be a fair estimate. Thank you. Thank you. Chief, one question for you was brought up about if you'd have to choose basically between an officer and a taser gun. I just want to make it clear is that we have all but one officer's position, I believe, filled in the city of Sheboygan now on a, on a street, is it? Since we're two? There, there's two. Two now? Right. Okay, with three retirement. Two vacancies. Okay. We would place. never never let a position go down off the street in place of a taser gun. Well, you're absolutely right. I, I certainly understand the budget the process. I understand right. that there's limits here or there. I, I think um, the issue of, of buying one taser or two tasers is not correct. I think if it's an issue that it's an officer safety concern, if it's the, the money should be found either through this budgetary process or through other sources. Um, as I said before, there has been one person who has come forth already. We do intend, as we talked about, a public protection and safety to look elsewhere. 
the issue is a normal officers it, they, they wear it as a normal piece of equipment it's another tool it's to replace either a baton and or the pepper spray not both either one of those two Sidmic recommends that if you equip your people with tasers you still have a baton or pepper spray because <coughs> you have to remember where this force or this tool is used. It's used before baton and before pepper spray. If it's not on the road, if it's on a supervisor's belt, that's not the proper place for it. And you will not see the, the results that could be seen if it's on every officer's belt. So I, um, to have one, no, that's, that's, that's not correct. To have two, or you put one on a captain, one on a lieutenant, and then see who gets there first. It's, it's to be used on those sets of circumstances where it's deemed appropriate. And I will guarantee you that it's done after policy formation, after a proper training. And you need, the $2,000 would probably not even buy the, the proper equipment to train all of our officers on. So uh, that, that's where we are at the present time. Um, do I want a piece of equipment or an officer? I want an officer. Exactly. I mean, an officer does a whole heck of a lot more than just fights with people or that the taser deals with. So, no, we understand we are two vacants, two okay. vacant positions. And we, we will work together to find the funding for the tasers. I believe that. Thank you. Okay, with that, would you call the roll, please? Serta. Aye. Graf. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. Laux. Aye. Manny. Aye. Montemayor, no. Perez, Sagali, Stefan, Van Akron, Aye. Warner, Aye. Bauman, Aye. and Berg. Aye. 12 ayes, 1 no. Motion carried. 2033 <laughs> through 36 to be referred. 2037 by law and licensing, recommending that beverage operators license 6650 be withdrawn from consideration as per the applicant's request. Alderman Manny. Thank you, Your Honor. On behalf of the committee, I move that we accept and adopt the report of the committee. Move and second, we accept and adopt the report of the committee. Under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. 2038 by finance, recommending authorizing the transfer of appropriation of the 2004 budget and passing the attached substitute resolution. Alderman Grog. Your Honor, I would move that the RC be accepted and, uh, and adopted and that the substitute resolution be put upon its passage. We have a motion and a second before us. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, would you call the roll, please? Graf? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Laux? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Perez? Aye. Sagali? Aye. Stefan? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Warner? Aye. Bauman? Berg Aye. and Serta, Aye. 13 eyes. Motion carried. 2039 by finance, recommending authorizing a transfer of appropriations in the 2005 budget. Alderman Groff. Yeah, and I would move that that RC be accepted and adopted and that the resolution be put upon its passage. We have motion and a second before us. Under discussion, Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to make a motion to hold the last transfer that from uh, for the incinerator <coughs> demolition until maybe the first meeting council meeting in March because I understand there is a businessman in Sheboygan who wants to talk to the city about purchasing this incinerator to from us with actual money so I'm hoping that we can um, have the plan commission address that gentleman and <coughs> maybe by the first meeting in March we'll know where we stand on that. Is this gentleman coming before plan commission or something, or one of the committees to request well, it? Well, I'm, ho I'm hoping we can refer this to the plan commission, and then I'll, I'll talk with them. I'll talk with Paul Adder, Tom Holton, about the person's name. Okay. Or your Honor, yes. be sent to redevelopment authority, or um, rather than plan right. commission? Right. Redevelopment authority. Redevelopment? No. Redevelopment. You want to? No. No. Because? <clears throat> no. For sale? No. Plan commission? Probably public works. Public works, I would say. Public works? Yes. Public works. That's Maybe they can go. make a sale. Public works. So, <clears throat> Alderman Montemayor, your motion is to hold and refer that one line item to public works. Is that what yes, your motion please. is? Under discussion, Alderman Sugali. 
Thank you, Your Honor. Are we able to um, talk to Tom Hokey concerning this? As the, are you aware of anything that's taking place now? No, I'm not. Uh, we've had a couple people in the past look at it. Once they get inside the building, they walk away and don't want anything to do with it. Uh, it's shot. The, the, ceil the ceiling's coming down, bricks falling off, soffit coming off, like most windows are busted out of it. Uh, it's a mess, and if it's on any private property, we'd be after them to fix it. It's a huge liability. We, don't, we want the space. We need the space for public works. We want to convert the foundation that to salt storage area. So that salt is out of our building. It's, it's ruining the steel in our building right now and the concrete walls in the building from the salt being piled against it. We can only hold about 1,000 ton. We go through maybe three or 4,000 ton a year and we're at the whim of the truckers to get the salt in here if we run out. Uh, last week, our salt was we're out of salt. As we were using that, there were trucks bringing in 400 ton for us and that, that's not a good situation either. But uh, I think it should stay in the public works area and I think that building should come down. So we do have a use for it, even if the yep. building comes down. We have a use yes, we do, and I can't believe there's anybody that has the money to get that thing back in shape with the floors just coming off. It's a concrete floor and ceiling, and the concrete's just falling off, and it's, it's <laughs> building a shot. Alderman Warner. I think I know we've been talking about the armory needs, or I mean the armory, well, the armory too, I guess. The incinerator needs to be taken care of over the last several years, and there were a lot of safety concerns involved in that building. I guess I don't have a problem for holding it for two weeks, but not till March. There's no sense in holding it till March. But if we can hold, have it go to Public Works and let them have them talk to this supposed individual, uh, and, and then bring it back to Council as a line on them. I mean, you know, I know that this is something that they've been looking at for a long time. We've had it out there. No one has come forward with any cash or money for it. It's it's been public knowledge several times that okay. it was available if somebody wanted it. And, so if you take it to Public Works, look at it, bring it back in two weeks. But I think the motion was to hold it till March, and oh, that I, was it. I clarified that with Alderman Montemeyer. I've got it for, um, to two hold weeks. the incinerator line item and refer that item to Public Works. Yeah. Hang, on, hang on one minute. Okay, Alderman Groff. I was, I was just going to say, um, Alderman Montemeyer, I, I believe you got the information from Alderman um, Vander Wheelie that... Yes, because um, the gentleman spoke with him on the telephone. Okay. Mm -hmm. and. Um, that's all the information we have right now about the proposed person that wanted to buy. Alderman Vanderwill shared that information with me too. Oh, okay. And that's it's possible that it could be a swap or a sale or okay. But no one has come forward yet, so it's a good two weeks isn't going to do anything. We wouldn't take it down in two weeks anyway. No, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Alderman Bowman. Thank you, Your Honor. I would have to ask for an amended agenda through Public Works because it already has been printed. So, needless to say, is that okay, Tom? Yes, we can do that tomorrow. Okay. Okay, we're holding for, well, let's vote on that separately. Do we need a roll call on just that one? Yeah, on the amendment, we're voting to hold the incinerator line item and refer that one item to Public Works. Correct. So, we're voting on the amendment only. Roll? We can do all of Okay. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Motion. <laughs> okay. Motion carries. <laughs> All right. Is there any? Alderman Groff. Then, Your Honor, as amended, I would move that the resolution be put upon its passage. We have a motion before us and a second. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, would you call the roll? Lokes. Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Perez? Aye. Sigali? Stefan. Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Warner? Aye. Bauman? Berg? No. Serta? Aye. Graf? Aye. And Kittleson? Aye. 11 to 2. Motion carried. 2040 will lie over. 2041 to be referred. 2042 goes to Public Works. Alderman Press. Thank you, uh, Mayor. I just had a question with respect to 2042. Uh, I received a call from this individual also, and my understanding is that this has been an ongoing thing. So I intend to be present at the public works meeting, and I would ask that if possible, maybe a, a historical account could be given to us then about what has happened, what has not happened. Apparently, I understand it's been going on for a while, so if uh, Alderman Bauman as chairman perhaps would... Uh, Assist me in that. Okay. Thank you. 
quite a while, I believe, and there's some, uh, well, Tom, maybe you want to explain a little bit? I can save it for Public Works, but that's been going on uh, for several years. I'm guessing it's probably going on for seven, eight, nine years, something like that. And it boils down to be, I believe, it's a private issue between the owner and the Tamarack complex. We thought we've had the issue resolved. We've stepped in twice uh, as recently as this fall and thought it was taken care of and it doesn't happen. But let's discuss it one more time and listen to the concerns and let's go through it yes. just to make sure. Sure. Alderman Groff. Yeah, thank you, Yenner. I was just wondering, um, wasn't a lot of this with the same apartment complex being handled by... Um, um, Housing Authority? Housing Authority, yes. And will, is that where home. the um, Public Works is going to be sending this to, or do they contact Housing Authority? Or I, I'm just wondering, because I think I know they've been handling that issue for, right. for quite a while, and um, if nothing else, they should be involved in this when Public Works meets on it. So Every time it's been sent to the Housing Authority, it died due to lack of action. So needless oh, okay. to say, it never did get acted on. All right. Well, let's see what we can do with it all in a moment. Thank you. 2043, by risk management, filing a document submitting a notice of a claim of American Family Insurance on behalf of Richard Woolrich regarding alleged damages to his vehicle when a city truck leaf vacuum hose broke loose and hit his vehicle and paying the claim in amount of $2,464.93. Risk management, Alderman Groff. Your Honor, I would move that the RC be accepted and adopted. Second. We have a motion and a second before us, under discussion. Hearing none, would you call the roll? Manny. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Perez. Aye. Sigali. Aye. Stefan. Aye. Van Akron. Aye. Warner. Aye. Bauman. Aye. Berg. Aye. Serta. Graf, aye. Kittleson, aye. and Lox. Aye. 13 ayes. Motion carried. Alderman Bowman? Oh, excuse me, other Steve. Other matters. Uh, 2044 is communication from Gina Steinhardt regarding her concerns with possible drug activity in her area and concerns with garbage that is being dumped by tenants of apartments in her neighborhood. Public protection and safety. 2045 is communication from Randy Ingalls, chairman of the 2005 ice bowling event and fundraiser, requesting permission to close Wildwood Avenue uh, to the Blue Line Ice Center and Juleson Court for the weekend of ice bowling, March 18th and 19th. Public protection and safety. 2046 is a communication from Paul Weaver, president of PCW Cycling, requesting permi permission for the PCW bicycling team to again host a cycling racing event on June 4th in the Sheboygan Business Center Industrial Park. Public protection and safety. 2047 is communication from Bishop E. Galileo Jose stating his concerns with the purchase of tasers for the police department. That'll go to public protection and safety also, but hang on a minute, Steve. Alderman Warner, you had? Uh, thank you, Aaron. Just one thing I know on uh, 2046 from Paul Weaver, I think that was typically a dual referral because Public Works has to work with Public with Works also? To okay. get in those streets closed off. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, wow. more. 2048 is a resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to accept a community grant from the Aurora Health Foundation for the donation of trail exercise stations to be placed along the Lakefront Recreation Trail to promote citizen wellness and healthy lifestyles. And that will go to Public Works. We have a motion and a second before us. All in favor? Aye. 